the ladies of Clangotlin, uh, well-behaved women seldom make history, they say. This is a story of two young women who defied cultural norms and set out to make a life together, thus making history. As you can see, this is, I'm going to cover now, uh, Lady Charlotte Eleanor Butler. Eleanor Butler's family acquired the castle in 1768 through a complex inheritance process. Her father, Walter Butler, was the only surviving relative of the second duke. His was a minor branch of the family. He was educated at the seminary of Douai, like many Catholic gentry evading the penal laws by spending time in France. Walter Butler of Kilcash, or Gary Ricken as he was known, um, was the 16th de jour Earl of Ormond. He did not assume these titles as he believed they were forfeit due to the actions of the second duke. The titles were successfully claimed later on by his son John, the 17th Earl. Despite financial struggles, Eleanor's mother, Eleanor Mores from Lara in Tipperary, took care of the family finances and sent her older sisters, Susie and Fanny, to the most prestigious convent of the Blue Nuns in Paris to be educated. Her father, though kind, was ineffectual and had a fondness for hunting and shooting. <laughs> Unfortunately for Eleanor, her mother viewed her daughters as mere pawns in pursuit of advantageous marriages. Around 1740, the family moved back to the Old Keep House. In December of that year, Eleanor's position in the family was dashed by the arrival of a son and heir. Displaced so early, she was to dislike her brother for the rest of her life. <laughs> Eleanor was sent to our Blessed Lady of Consolation, an English Benedictine convent in Cambrai. The convent already had connections with Eleanor's family and aunt had lived there. These convents were managed by liberal, well-educated and aristocratic women. They boasted good libraries and fostered liberal intellectual climate. Nellie, as she was known then, was content during her time at the convent and would often burst into French phrases and song for the rest of her life. The convent education had a lasting impact on her. Upon returning to Kilkenny, Eleanor found it to be a remarkable and civilised city that had been transformed from sluttishness. The Sheep Inn was known for its cleanliness and boasted a cook so fine he wore ruffles like a gent. It was said that no man spent the early part of the night at home but instead at the wheat sheaf or the hole in the wall. There is an old rhyme associated with Kilkenny and it said, says, if you ever go to Kilkenny, remember the hole in the wall, you might get blind drunk for a penny or, or tipsy for nothing at all. <laughs> Eleanor's brother renounced Catholicism and married Anne, the daughter and heiress of Lord Wandersworth in Castlecomer. Her two sisters married two prominent Catholics, Thomas Monarch Cavanagh of Boris and Morgan Cavanagh of Ballyhale. Meanwhile, Madame Butler tried unsuccessfully to arrange a marriage for her daughter or convince her to join an honorary. And just note, Cambrai was the Duke of Wellington's headquarters for the British Army between 1815 and 1880. 18, and he actually visited them in Clangochlan. The Ponsonbys, the Right Honourable Sarah Ponsonby, they were originally Cumberland squires who had fought for Cromwell, and this resulted in a viscountcy, and a generation later, generation later, the earldom of Bessborough, which is now Kildalton College. Her grandfather had fought in Flanders, and he was killed in battle in 1743, but just before he was shot, he handed his watch and ring to his son, Sarah's father, Chambre Brabazon Ponsonby. Sarah's father married three times. The first marriage lasted six years. However, he lost his wife and son, but his remaining daughters, Elizabeth and Frances Ponsonby, survived to adulthood. The second marriage to Louise Lyons resulted in the birth of Sarah, born in Dublin in 1755. Sarah's mother died when she was three. Undeterred by adversity, he married a third time, an heiress, Mary Barker, the daughter of Sir William Barker, who was a, the baronet of Kilcooley House, I'm sure you all know it. Sarah's half-brother, Chambray, was born on the 12th of June in 1762, but after his father's death on the 20th of February of that year, leaving both Sarah and Chambray orphaned. Her stepmother rallied, and married Sir Robert Staples of Dunmore. 
She died leaving Sarah at the age of 13, six years later. Not only was she orphaned, but destitute. She was effectively disposed of any fortune she may have been entitled to due to the birth of her brother. Lady Staples left Kilcooley House to her son, Chambray. Lady Betty Ponsonby, daughter of the first Earl and cousin of Sarah, took in Sarah when her stepmother died. She had married a Sir William Founds with a diary of £4,000 which insisted in building the house we know as Woodstock and Innistic today. Sarah was then sent to Miss Park's boarding school in Kilkenny. During a visit to the castle, she met Eleanor. It is believed that this was engineered to give Eleanor something to do. Eleanor was fluent in French and had a love of books that found an eager pupil in Sarah. Their displacement within their families caused them to become friends. When Sarah returned 18 in 1773, she returned to live with her cousin, Lady Betty. Although she experienced the social season in Dublin and in Bath, she was happiest in Woodstock. Eleanor and Sarah remained in contact through letters, and these letters brought great joy to Sarah, especially since she was subject at that time to the unwanted attentions of Sir William. This was a period of Romanticism. Romanticism originated in Europe toward the end of the 18th century and was at its peak from 1760 to 1840, reaching England after the Napoleonic Wars. Romanticism is a movement characterised by its emphasis on emotion and individualism. Think Wordsworth. This is a story of a bond between two women that blossomed out of loneliness within their families. They had a clear and strong sense of their feelings, but they also enjoyed the luxury and ideals of their social class. Romantic friendship encompassed many aspects of what we now associate with sexual love, such as affection, devotion, sensitivity, and shared interests. Eleanor and Sarah's commitment and dedication to each other might have been such an example of this movement. Now, the third runaway. Mary Carroll was brought up in a poor family in Euros, and little is known about her until she was employed by Lady Betty. If she accompanied the ladies to Wales immediately or after Lady Betty died is not clear. Mary was seen as a friend and was never paid throughout her life, but was allowed to keep all the tips from, obviously, the visitors that visited Clangochlan. Um, they did pay for her hair powder. Apparently, that's a thing. <laughs> Mary was an extremely valuable asset to the ladies, and in, there are two diary notes. I, if I put them all in, we'd be here till next week. Um, boat herrings and oysters, a loud and violent altercation between Mary and the fishman. And Eleanor says, Mary triumphant. <laughs> Another note uh, for Mary says, Mary was in her glory, purchasing beef for hanging and exerting all her powers of eloquence in bargaining with the butchers. Mary was to entertain in their kitchen the landlord and family, which could be up to 12 people, on Boxing Day annually. When she died, she left a plot of land called Aberatha and monies to Sarah. Although not married, she was always referred to as Mrs. The Great Escape. I'm not going to cover that because I think everybody knows what happened there. In March of 1778, on May the 4th, they waved goodbye to Woodstock and left for Waterford. However, the boat that was on shore for four days, and it was possibly due to the American privateer Paul Jones on the bo boat called the Ranger that was near at hand. However, on Friday the 9th of May, they left Ireland forever. Eleanor stayed amicable with her eldest sister in Boris and her brother-in-law for the rest of their life. This was probably due to the fact that there was an intercession by them that allowed them to go. She never wrote to her other family, and it was 14 years before her mother actually had her address. The Welsh arrival. After arriving, they went on the ferry from Milford Haven to Pembroke, visited St David's Cathedral, and you can see some of our people there when we visited. Um, they went northwards to, then to North Wales. They stayed in Oswestry Street near the border as it was their intention at that time to buy a cottage in England, but it was too expensive. They stayed almost a month in Carnarvonshire. When Sarah saw uh, Clangochlan, she was a lover of the picturesque and recorded 
it as a pretty village on the River Dee and thought it, it the most beautifulest in the country. Her words, not mine. <laughs> Dinas Bran, Chirk Castle and Abbey Vale Cruises were explored and Cruises was to be the place of many picnics with her friends, eating grouse sandwiches, pineapples and apricots. The first year they spent in Wales was in Blaine Bach. However, it proved to be too remote. So, this was the square cottage with four acres behind the village that they rented. The annual rent was £22, 7 and sixpence, and they named it Plas Newit, which they say is New Place, but I know Plas can mean palace, mansion or hall, so I'm not sure about that. Their landlord was John Edwards from Pengwen. Despite their infatuation with their new life, Clangoughlin was a depressing little town. However, its vitality was due to the passage of Irish travellers with whom it was a favourite stop. It did have weekly market and five fairs a year, and the post came three times a week. Few people knew of their whereabouts at the time, only Mrs Tighe and their good friend Lucy Goddard, who lived in Bath. From the beginning, they sought to put down roots in the community. Eleanor and Sarah settled into their new home and began making alterations and plans for a library. They purchased car carpets from Kendall of Sarancester in Gloucestershire, but even in Wales things were not cheap and they overspent disastrously. Their plans included a chicken yard, stable, dairy, pottager, melon and mushroom beds, vines and orchards. They were already raising roses, collecting seeds of holly from their walks. Their project book was full of ideas and they would have been content if not for their financial anxieties. Eleanor suffered from migraines and fainting fits. The financial situation became serious, prompting Sarah to write to her father's cousin, Lord Bespra, who was Lord of the Treasury and Postmaster General, and he promised her 50 pounds. And he mentioned that he too was scarce of money. <laughs> he, he later wrote again to say that she did not need to send him a purse she had made, as he was a man and it were of no use. <laughs> Despite their straitened circumstances, old friends visited them, including Sarah's half-sister, Mrs Lother, and her brother, Chambre. Lady Dungannon, grandmother of the Duke of Wellington, visited also, and she lived in the area, and introduced them to the local gentry. The Mrs Elizabeth and Letitia Barrett were among their dearest friends, until a misunderstanding temporarily divided them. More about that later. They would often solicit friends by saying what was on the menu. Nine, breakfast. Two new laid eggs from our Jersey hens. Dinner at three. Boiled chicken from our own coop. Asparagus from our garden. Ham of our saving and mutton from the village. And then for supper, gooseberry fool, cranberry tarts, roast fowl and salad. Their standards were very high. On the 3rd of June, 1782, Eleanor's father died and she was not mentioned in the will, this thousand pounds that was always on her mind. After much haggling, Lodge Morris succeeded in securing an allowance of 200 pounds a year from her brother, together with a lump sum of 500 to pay off her debts. This plus the 80 pounds per annum for Mrs. Tighe was their annual income in 1778. 100 pounds in 1778 has the equivalent purchasing power now of about £23,000 and one shilling the purchasing power of about £4.60 sterling. So they were well off. The library uh, was a haven for them and this is some of the books and as you can see they are leather bound, golden engraved with their names on them so poverty was not really an issue I think. The library was a haven from them and a note from the journal says, it was April, the library windows thrown open, gentle wind rustling through the leaves, cooing of wood pigeons, sweet pipe of the thrushes and blackbirds, finished thoughts on the importance of the manners of the great in general society. My beloved and I went to the Hope Circuit, how we enjoyed it, a day of the most delicious and sweetly peaceful retirement. These are the books read in one month, and some of them are tomes. But uh, Eleanor would prepare uh, what she had to read, 
and then re would read it to her beloved Sally. Rumours always abounded that the retirement was over because Sarah was a bully or Eleanor had consumption or it could be the other way round. Letters flew back and forth between the castle and Clangochlan about her settlement on her brother's marriage. They gained a thousand pounds. But however, things after writing letters of stating of injustice in the morning, by the afternoon, they made transcripts while commenting on those passing the window with loads of hot dung for the manure for the mushroom bed or completing a new wall in the garden as the man passed by. At night, they would read Spencer, Milton and Cook's voyages in front of the blazing fire, their troubles forgotten. The system of retirement was dropped a couple of times, so they overnighted with the Barris sisters in Oswestry or stayed with the Bridgeman family in Staffordshire. However, these visits only heightened their retirement. There were enough vexations to test their devotion. There was a system of pensions for noble and ancient families that had fallen on hard times, the Irish civilist. So Sarah wrote to her Ponsby relations as the granddaughter of a general killed in active service. However, they had already applied on behalf of an aunt, so there was no luck there. <laughs> Eleanor's brother was equally cruel and said, cruel and said if they made any more applications he'd cut her off altogether. Then, all forgotten as usual, they'd walk away their troubles in their garden. These pictures, I see the one beforehand, um, one was uh, done by, um, the original was done by uh, Lady Leighton and the subsequent one here was done by uh, James Henry Lynch. But are they a cheat? Is it a pirate, the second one, if you look at it? Their ladies' faces are exactly the same. It's just the backgrounds that have changed. The four acres were transformed into a firm ornay. At this stage, the landlord's son wanted to increase their rent, but he didn't succeed. And El Eleanor waxed lyrical on the simple chores and noted in her diary heavenly even evenings and the simple delights of being wakened by Barbara churning. Eleanor asked Francis Douglas, Lady Buckley, to intercede and succeeded in getting them another £100 in 1787 from the Steeles Civil List. No matter a lack of money, they firmly retained three booksellers, two in English and one in French. They had a gardener, a footman and two maids. The, the footman proved a bit unsatisfactory early on, so ever, ever after that they only employed females. Improvements continued building a circular stone dairy with circular windows. They had over their time four cows, Margaret, Primrose, Linda and Glory, and Glory often took walks with them. They liked their rustic friendships and considered them more precious than those in the fashionable world. The pleasures of being self-supporting and delighting in simple food gave them great pleasure, as well as reading Rousseau to her darling Sally in front of the fire. Mrs. Tighe and her daughter Hannah visited and was charmed by the cottage and sampled Mary Carroll's excellent salmon pie. Hannah, her daughter, drew uh, the porch and some cats. She was taught by Maria Spilsbury, who was the painter of John Wesley preaching in Ireland. There was a detente with the butlers. Lady Anne visited them on their way to Bath, and Sarah wrote how flattering and comfort comfortable the visit had been. That particular year, they had an income of £389.03 and, and one pence, but an expenditure of £444, 13 shillings and two pence. They would not have come through this year had they not received £75 from Sarah's brother, Chambray, and a further £50 from Lord Bresbury, and a loan from their solicitor. <laughs> Here's a random sample of their outgoings. They're not in any particular order, but just to give you an idea. Servants, £39. At that time, Peggy and the maid was paid five shillings a week. Candles per annum, five shillings. Uh, doing things in the bakehouse, one and eightpence. Meat for annually, £23.12 shilling and ninepence. Rent was only £22.76. Books, £35. They spent more on books than on rent. And poor Moses Jones, the gardener, got 10 shillings a week. However, the house and servant tax was £4.2 and six. And Eleanor noted with glee one November that she had, she had evaded the stamp. Uh, their hatter was paid £14 and six shillings and downs their outfitters £10. But also, I noted, 
five gallons of Frontiac wine to entertain the Barretts. <laughs> they liked their candles, but they had to have no tallow smell and Windsor soap, but these were bought by the pound plus carriage. And there is a little inventory of bought four cheeses weighing 106 pounds for the family from Parry, from Parry the farmer. From their journeys and from their diaries and journals, we see Eleanor and Sarah devoting their hearts and minds to self-improvement. They also made notes of various topics, whether it was recipes, garden plants, anecdotes about tradesmen, good and bad, and the negative aspects of chimney sweeps. Apparently, he only cleaned halfway up. Anyway, they had a fire in the drawing room chimney, which could have been disastrous, if, it not, if not for the intervention of their neighbours. The fire is, was ex extinguished by the potter's son, who climbed up on the roof, poured pails of water down, handed to him by the neighbours, and used a holly bush with a stone to bring down the burning soot. Now, there's a tip. As a token of gratitude, everybody involved was treated to bear and later received awards of shillings and sixpences. Their journal entries reveal numbers of instances of shillings and sixpences bestowed on individuals, including Jeanette, the local witch, and poor Mary Green, who featured regularly getting shillings and sixpences. Another woman mentioned a lot in their diaries, and it goes as I.W. for Irish woman, who apparently served as their postman. Remember, it was only three days a week in Clangochlan. She was often called upon to fetch items from Wrexham, which is nine miles away, but I looked it up and the historical route is six miles, but it was still three, three hours walk, and she is usually played one and six for her services. Now, these are some of the roses, Angela, pay attention, um, <laughs> that they grew in 1798. And for the gardening fans, you can take a pick. Apparently, they're in Prince's Manual of Roses. Now, there are two recipes, one for killing caterpillars, cold potato water, and to prevent creepy crawlies on fruit bushes, sheep's wool smothered in soot. These are a pair of chocolate cups that were used by the ladies. They're now in the British Museum. The cups have a view of their cottage and their family arms. It was most unusual for women at the time to have these. There's a recipe for chocolate in case you want it. It was to simmer chocolate on a slow fire, two ounces per cup, stir it with a chocolate mill, and when it was thickened, add an egg white. Then you beat it up, throwing the first froth away. This will be proper consistent and better froth. It is best made the day before using. Here are some of their recipes. <coughs> if you read that first recipe down, folks, it is hilarious, because uh, you definitely serve it with fried bread. And there's a, a recipe there for nice pastry. Can you see how much butter is in it? There are also recipes in their journals for preserving oranges, salmon pie, and how to pickle beef or make cucumber soup. They and their family ate well. There's another story. Mr Edwards of the Hand, which was the local pub and chase and hostelry, presented a bill of 52 pounds, six shillings and five pence halfpenny. The cost of travelling at the time by coach was one penny per mile. Eleanor considered the bill exorbitant, but she may have forgotten how many outings she had made. Edwards was summoned and interrogated. The Barrett sisters visited at the same time, but unfortunately they had taken the chase from the hand, not the new one, the favoured lion. They left unaware of their transgression. They did not speak to the Barretts for a year. She called, uh, Eleanor called them false and perfidious friends. But they owed Barrett's the money, so that might be the reason. Because later on it says John Butler sent them £100 and £50 was set aside to pay off the heavy debt to them. According to Eleanor, the debt pressed heavy like a dagger on her heart. Eleanor and Sarah continued to enjoy life's sim simple pleasures. However much they contended with perfidious friends, drunken gardeners, chimney sweeps who did not perform their duties thoroughly, the bills and headaches of their normal daily lives, there was another blow. The General Evening Post published an article titled An Extraordinary Female Affection, which delved into the history of, of the ladies. The article featured none too glamorous descriptions of Eleanor, but portrayed Eleanor kindly. It is also mentioned that 
They also mentioned their annual pensions from the Steel Civil List and their Irish annuities. Although the article may have been close to the truth, Eleanor disliked having their private lives exposed in public and cancelled the paper. Unfortunately, the article stuck in people's minds. In 1819, there's an entry in the diaries and it just says, purchased our house. Now, whether that was the thousand pounds that eventually came or whether it came as the result of the butlers selling their wine uh, interest to the Crown for 216,000 pounds, not sure, no, no idea. But still, uh, their garden, as you can see, was pretty. And Mr. Steed of, Sneed of Belmont, apparently the botanist of all England, visited and gave them timely advice on the treatment of dieback on their apricot trees and the leaf curl on their ne nectarines. There were over 1,600 visitors to the house in their lifetime, so I've only put up the Irish connections. Only favourites stayed overnight, and only favourites were invited in. And you can see from the, the list there that they were, it was the great and the good that visited, but some were better received than others. Visitors started the house in, in 1782. Eleanor would often imperiously ask for their credentials uh, so the, to, keep, to keep things private after the uh, article in the paper. But some they allowed, and being curious themselves, they would spy on them from either the bedchamber or the shrubbery. Mm -hmm. um, Colonel Manzer St. George, of this parish, and I believe his cousin is sitting down there at the back, mm -hmm. proved to be most entertaining, and Eleanor's diary notes they were sorry to see when this agreeable man made his bow. Comte de Janac turned up at the hand and told him he was there and gave them a blow by blow of the uh, description of what was happening in Paris in 1789. I have two witness accounts that I'd like to include John Lockhart in 1819. He met two women dressed in heavy blue riding habits, men's hats their petticoats tucked up. They both had a world of brooches and rings. He said, who could paint the prints, the dogs, the cats, the miniatures, the whirly gigs of every shape and hue, the whole house outside and inside covered with carved oak. Their tables were piled with newspapers from every corner of the kingdom, and they seemed to have the deaths and marriages of, of the Antipodes at their fingertips. <laughs> There, they had albums and autographs from Louis XVI and George IV. He said, I shall never see the spirit of blue stockingism again in such perfect incarnation. They have long been the guardian angels of the village and are worshipped by man, woman and child. The second uh, witness is 1828 was a Prince uh, Maukos. He was a nobleman, German, renowned for his la artist and landscape gardening. The two ladies wore a unique combination of clothing that was a mix of gentlemen's overcoat and ladies' riding habit. They also wore a round hat, cravat, waistcoat and short jupon. I looked this up and it says underskirt in some and it says padded tunic in others, along with boots. Eleanor wore the grand cordon of the Order of Collar of St. Louis around her waist with a silver lily, life-sized, as was the star on her breast, which she said was a present from the Bourbon family. Apparently, she was offered the curl of Napoleon, but she declined on, her, on account of her relationship with the Bourbon family. <laughs> These two ladies were obliging and entertaining without any affectation, speaking French as well as any noble Englishman. They had cheerful manners that were typical of good society at the time, and I couldn't help but notice the younger lady's natural and tender consideration of Eleanor's every need. A typical costume at the time for their short hair was a trend after the French Revolution and also the riding jacket in the Georgian era the men's riding jacket was made shorter that the women wore as a day when they're out during the daytime and there's a lovely picture of Caroline Hamilton her cousin with short hair and you know Caroline ha Hamilton she visited too but her and Lord Byron will say no more this is a gravestone of Mary and Sarah and it said, two, friend, two friends who will her loss be mourn. They thought very highly of her. And if you read the inscription, it really comes across. Guess who that little fat lady is there? Um, Eleanor made a will in favour of Sarah. That I might secure all I am possessed of are entitled to the beloved of my heart, Sarah. 
After Sarah's death in 1831, the place was sold to a Miss Andrew and a Miss Lolly. The auction catalogue, which was sent to Princess Victoria, featured five pastured fields of the richest land, well forested, summer houses with carved oak and rustic seats, calf house, garden house, yard, storehouse and engine pump, four gardens in great order, stocked with fruit trees of all kind, vegetables and flowers, shaded gravel walks. I think they reached their goal on that. Eleanor and Sarah's life had a profound impact on their contemporaries, but also on future generations. Living with the backdrop of the French and Industrial Revolution, the riots in Birmingham, they contributed to a period of change through their brave and tenacious personalities. They defied societal expectations and fought for women's rights, although inadvertently. Eleanor and Sarah embraced a life of happiness, contentment and celebrity, unafraid to be different. Their lives symbolise the possibility of change and reminds us to strive towards acceptance when people take the road less travelled. I think their lives of 50 years mustn't be eclipsed by a six-week period from March 30th, 1778 to May 4th, 1778, before they left Ireland. In 1963, the contents of the two wings were sold before they were demolished, leaving Place Newid almost in the form it was when the ladies occupied it. And in 1966, 1996, it has been owned by Denbyshire Council and is open to the public. Thanks for listening to me. Oh.